Uh, today we're gathered here for the screening of the film uh, Justice for Sale, as was just mentioned. Uh, and this is the third uh, film of a trilogy by Femke and Ilse van Velze, uh, both about, uh, all three about uh, rape in the DRC and the impunity surrounding this crime. Uh, the first of those uh, three movies focused largely on the victims and on uh, silence surrounding the crime. The second one more on the perpetrators and their motives for and ways of going about their crime. And this third film rather zooms in on one particular rape case uh, that ends up in court. Now, contrary perhaps to expectations, and I should probably say also not to everyone's liking, especially not um, some of the civil society organization, human rights NGOs involved, uh, the film does not focus on a case um, uh, showing the difficulties of rape victims to get their cases to court. Um, it rather focuses on uh, a man uh, named uh, Masamba who is accused of rape and who also receives a sentence of 10 years imprisonment while the case against him seems very weak. The evidence seems very limited. So the film follows a human rights lawyer, uh, a lady called Claudine, who takes up this case and starts to investigate it. Um, one explanation given in this film uh, for the, the outcome of this court case uh, points to uh, corruption and political interference. Uh, at one point in the film, you find uh, the lawyer that uh, represented uh, Masambi, um, uh, Masamba in uh, the two in the, in the court case, saying that, um, well, more or less saying that he's been pressured and that if uh, the tape of that interview would be shown in court, that he would have difficulty getting his other cases heard. Um, why I'm pointing this out is because I think there's generally a tendency to oversimplify uh, or, or to think that interference in court cases take the form of one of the parties going to uh, a judge and uh, getting a different outcome. Um, and this, this example shows that it's much more intricate and many other examples show the same thing. Um, I remember a big project in Indonesia. Um, first of all, it was a research into judicial corruption which showed that in most cases, both parties had gone to the judge to offer him money, and that in most of these cases where it was quite clear cut who had the strongest case legally seen, that the judge only accepted the bribe of that party, uh, which I thought was a very interesting outcome. Uh, but there was a larger proje a project uh, after this uh, research uh, focusing on um, restructuring the Indonesian courts, particularly uh, the Makama Agung, the uh, Supreme Court. Um, um, so it focused on, I think, on uh, computerizing the court. It focused on uh, publishing uh, case law material, uh, more technical kind of things. But it also focused specifically on corruption. And one of the things that came out of this, what they brought in a number of younger, um, it seemed rather uncorruptible uh, judges into the Supreme Court. And then it turned out that they had severe difficulty making an impact because the person who divided the cases over the judges had to be bribed to buy yourself a case. So the judge had already you know, to pay money to get the case from which he could then make a profit himself. So there's all these different ways uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely not as clear-cut as one of the parties going to uh, a judge. There's also a very interesting uh, PhD research uh, from about two years ago by a Chinese lady called Li Ling, who looked at, rather at the how of judicial corruption, in the sense of how do you go about doing this? She used to start her, the, the lectures that she gave in one of our courses with, so you want to know how to bribe a Chinese judge? So this was really about how to establish a relationship because you can't just walk up to someone and, and put the money there because what if he doesn't want it? Or, um, Of course, one of the things there was that the culture of gift giving that exists in many uh, developing countries offers a sort of more legitimate opening uh, for, for corruption requests. Um, 
In addition, the culture of paper archives makes it much more easy uh, for uh, cases to disappear, archives not to be there anymore, and that's something that we will see with regard to the medical archives. I'm not saying it was corruption there, but I mean, you do see all those papers and they have to try and find the right medical report, so that triggered my idea of this. Um, a particular way, another way in China where it's difficult to get your case, uh, you know, get access to justice, is that courts often just don't take on certain cases that the government has told them not to take on. Um, and lawyers are pressured also to not to defend uh, people in those kind of cases. Okay, so this is the, a bit on the corruption side of it, but um, another explanation um, that uh, the film uh, makers point to, uh, explanation of why uh, Masamba lost his case, um, the, the film focuses on uh, the international attention given to the huge numbers of uh, rape victims in the DRC uh, and the attention given to the, the fact that these are largely uh, unpunished, so the impunity surrounding them. Um, and of course, this has had led to a big or renewed interest of many local NGOs to combat uh, the impunity of most of those crimes. Um, and this has led these NGOs with international donor money to now bring such cases to court, to support the victims, and to provide a lawyer for them. What they do not do is provide a defendant with a counsel, which to a certain extent is understandable, but in a country such as the DRC, it means that due process for the, uh, for the defendant is very much from guaranteed. An additional aspect mentioned in the film is that these organizations are perhaps somewhat too interested in convictions, as these are tied in with their ability to find future international funding. Now this aspect ties in with a bigger issue that I'd like to briefly mention, which is the interest of donor community in legal reform or legal development cooperation. I guess this already dates from the 1970s with the first law and development scholarship and law and development kind of programs. At that time, uh, on the one hand, focusing on legal education, on the other hand, more on uh, legal transplanting and the writing of laws and the transplanting of laws from their own countries to uh, the new countries. Um, this was discarded a decade later, uh, largely because it was seen, on the one hand, as cultural imperialism. On the other hand, uh, it was seen that you can't just transplant a law from one culture to another and one administrative system and all the peculiarities of a certain country, you can't just transplant it. Nevertheless, in the 1980s, there's a sort of resurgence again of an interest in uh, uh, upgrading the legal system of many developing countries, first in the wake of good governance, um, especially uh, within good governance, they saw the need for a well-functioning legal system, at least in the beginning, as far as this was needed for a well-functioning market. So you get an emphasis on drafting of laws, such as in investment and banking laws, uh, and the establishment of commercial co uh, courts. Um, but over time, it becomes like exclusively focused on the market, and there's an interest in broader rule of law reforms. Now, traditionally, you get that these donor-led legal, legal reform projects, which are labeled as rule of law orthodoxy, um, they emphasize formal institutions. So the judiciary, legislators, the police, prisons. Um, but there was quite some critique, again, about a decade later on this, both the conce conceptual critique that the concept is way too broad, that rule of law is used for almost everything and for various different goals, so that it's very hard to reach your goal when what you want is to reach a rule of law. Uh, but also for its failure to uh, bring development, particularly when development is seen as uh, enhancing the position of the poor, so as a very pro-poor kind of development. Um, what you get then in the last decade is um, the development of a new sort of bundle of ideas, uh, which maybe we can term by bottom-up approaches to legal development cooperation. Um, known concepts, well-known concepts by now are, of course, access to justice and legal empowerment. Um, 
they mostly focus on the obstacles the poor have when engaging with the legal systems. Um, so first are problems related to legislation uh, and to courts, so the pro-poor bias or actually the anti-poor bias, agenda bias in legislation, in courts. Um, and on the other hand, on obstacles that the poor have when encountering the law, uh, in the sense of um, that the poor's difficulty in using the legal system are caused by the poor's own particular char characteristics. So a lack of financial capacity, lack of experience in dealing with formal justice institutions, um, of course, limited legal awareness, um, knowledge of law and their rights. Um, so if you look at access to justice, it's both about access and about justice, obviously. So access largely sees, about access, sees to access to courts, which has to do with the cost, the time, the understanding of what's going on there, the language used, um, the geographical distance. Um, but it also has to do with, is there access to influence lawmaking uh, to get an enforcement of court decisions? Um, um, can people find legal representation, etc.? The access to justice part, so the justice part is in the, are these laws pro-poor? Are the judges pro-poor? Uh, is there judicial independence? Is there impunity of governments and law enforcement agents, etc.? So you get this trend more to bottom-up approaches. Within this trend, there starts to be a realization that um, more attention should be given to customary justice systems. Before you find that they were largely regarded as sort of incompatible with the modern nation state uh, and, and something to be ignored rather than, than strengthened or engaged with. Um, but now there's a realization that customary justice systems actually uh, play a more important role in the lives of many of the uh, poor in developing countries than state justice systems do. Um, so the, the consequences of these more rule of law orthodoxy programs often did not affect the poor very much. So now that it was seen that customary justice system were actually the lived reality of most people in developing countries, especially in rural areas, uh, you get a renewed interest also from donors in that. Um, they were mainly interested for a number of the positive aspects, such as, of course, um, accessibility, physical accessibility, uh, familiarity of the procedures, understandable language, limited costs in dispute settlement procedures, um, short duration normally of the dispute resolution, uh, knowledge of the local context among dispute settlers, um, and perhaps a more restorative nature of the process. A lot of the literature fo um, focuses on uh, the prominence of these customary justice systems as dispute settlement systems. But I guess you should add that, in fact, uh, in fact, the most important aspect of customary justice systems is in the regulation of uh, important aspects of daily lives. Uh, for instance, when we think about access to land and natural resources, uh, but also uh, family issues such as inheritance and marriage. But for those issues, those administrative issues, one could say mainly the same kind of things. So physical presence, familiarity with local contacts, limited costs. Despite all these positive, or I mean these positive aspects are the reason why donors wanted to engage with it in combination that the state legal system seemed to be very remote for most people in developing countries. But at the same time, these donors are worried about a number of other aspects of uh, traditional justice systems. Uh, one can think of uh, the susceptibility of a lead capture, which is stimulated or made possible by the fact that these systems are unwritten. Um, secondly, uh, that customary systems are seen as having limited effect in stimulating economic development. Uh, perhaps most of you will be familiar with the work of Hernando de Soto. I mean, this view has been debated long before uh, his presence, uh, I guess since the colonial period, but it's now commonly linked to his theory. Um, he argues that most property and businesses of the poor are regulated in informal, so non-state normative systems uh, and not formally recognized by state law and this makes it very hard to um, participate in larger markets, uh, get loans, uh, etc. 
Now, a third issue uh, that donors worry about is um, the violation of human rights uh, standards and constitutional practices by uh, customer justice systems. One can think of severe punishments. Uh, one can definitely think of gender equality. Uh, the whole system is basically a male elderly system. Um, so you find now that they want to engage with customer justice systems. But what does that mean? What does it mean to engage with an unwritten system that has its own leaders, that differs from this area to that area? Um, so you find that a lot of these projects, one of the first things they do after their first scoping study is say, we need to put these laws into writing. We need to put these customary norms into writing. Um, and with that, largely ignoring uh, all the literature and all the lessons that exist from this same attempt that was undertaken in the 1960s, uh, quite largely at least after independence in uh, Africa, led by the School of Oriental and African Studies, to restate customary law, uh, which was not very effective, which led to a huge gap between the new recorded version and the continually evolving local differing versions, also because there was a big unification going on in that codification or restatement of one or a few versions. Um, so there's particular difficulties with working with customary law. Um, in, 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 the, uh, in the coffee just now, I was, I was talking to Ilza and she also said that the second film in the trilogy also ends with, um, um, with a reconciliation for a rape case. And so there's a lot of attention into both customary law and more ADR reconciliation. But this drew a lot of criticism because, of course, uh, there's also a lot of people who are not very happy with this. Uh, and I remember a particular case of Namibia where they had a big research report um, where they tried to find why many women brought their rape cases to the police but then withdrew them to settle at the customary uh, arena. And uh, it's, that was obviously because at the local level one can get compensation, whereas at the national level or I mean at state courts or at the police, all that happens is that the, the, the perpetrator goes to prison but the community or the family or the victim doesn't get anything. So you can understand this, that this is happening. At the same time, of course, there's big questions to ask with regard to the deterrent effect of a, a mere monetary payment, especially when this is not necessarily carried out, uh, 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 not necessarily a burden on the perpetrator himself, but on his whole family. And secondly, often this is negotiated between families, so it's the question whether it's also the victim who would like to see this payment, which is different than from the case that you were describing, or whether it's the family that actually goes for that. Um, what, one last area where obviously we find both an interest still in legal reform, rule of law strengthening, uh, but also more and more into non-state uh, sectors is um, uh, both conflict reconstruction and transitional justice measures. Uh, if you look at all the programs going on in, uh, in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, but also uh, in Sierra uh, uh, Leone, for instance, um, you see also, again, these same kind of trends. Um, this last bit really um, uh, ties in with my own research agenda, which is on change processes within customary law. Um, so that's partly why I brought it up. So I'm not quite sure whether I've done what Jeroen asked me to do, which is contextualize the movie, but these are the things that got me thinking while watching it. So I thought maybe it also works as an introduction to get you started on it. <laughs>